Hey guys, and welcome back. And if you're new here, thanks for joining us today. Day 16, and it is still at the Wiki Wachi Spring State Park. Yep, you got it. <laughs> so we are going to follow along on the ranger show. Ranger experience. The ranger experience, and they're basically going to talk about the wildlife that you see here in the springs. Mm -hmm. So stick around so that you can check out the wildlife firsthand and hear what the rangers have to say. She got in here? Oh. Doesn't even look real. Because he's not. Oh, okay. yeah. there you go. Perfect. Perfect. How's everyone doing today? Hello. That's wonderfully here. It's a warm, sunny, beautiful day here at our park, and we're happy to have you. One of my favorite things to do is ask our guests, hey, is this special place like us? What do you think of? What makes it special here? Mermaids. The mermaids. That's what put us on the map back in 1947. That's about 20 years for Disney is here in Florida. They're an original roadside attraction. We're pretty special. What are wonderful mermaids going to be doing any of that that are beautiful spring? Because your wiki watchy with it's known as a first magnitude. That means our spring is able to pump out roughly 64 million gallons of pure drinking water a day. That's an amazing refugee animals and people as well. But we're much more than just a spring-based park here. Outside the attraction area, we have a thousand acres protected land. And one that habitat's out there is a really important one. It's an area known as Scrubland. Scrubland kind of looks like a western desert mixed with a grassland. It's sparsely planned for parts, but there's a lot of light hidden out there. And today, we'll be focusing on that life. I'll be bringing out a few native animals that call Florida home. But before I get too far ahead of myself, there is a couple of things that we go over, like my name. My name is Ranger Carrington, and I'll be your guide today. The important part to take away from that is, if something goes wrong during my program, that is not my name. <laughs> but now that we got that part out of the way, we move back to focusing on our animals. One of the first critters I have here today loves to call the scrumpling home. And a few adaptations that help them live in this hot environment. Here we have a gopher tortoise. The gopher tortoise is a one of six species of tortoises found here in North America. So we have east of the Mississippi River. This is the only one that is found. They're really well adjusted for this environment. That is rough scaly skin, large shell, and shell-like appendage on the front. Their back legs are really rough and scaly, almost like an elephant's foot. They're really built for the land. And these guys won't even need standing water to drink. They're getting all the hydration they need from the food they eat. And that's one of the big reasons why we see them hanging out in our yards. We love to have that beautiful green lawn, so you make sure to water it regularly. And by doing that, we make a nice luscious salad for our tortoises. And then, they might start to dig their burrows out there. And people get a little concerned. They think it might collapse. Why well, want to be too worried about that? The gopher tortoise is a master architect. Their entire life revolves around digging. In fact, these burrows can range from around 40 feet long and 10 feet deep will be a little less than a few inches. And inside these burrows, they can house over 350 different species of animals. Everything from other tortoises, fox turtles, snakes, owls, foxes, and coyotes would all call this burrow a home. In a way, that's an apartment complex. 
Hmm. It's a home for all those critters. And with this individual right here, I 100% know for a fact that she's a female. We take a look at this tail here. And we notice it's very short and stubby. Males have much longer tail and a concave stomach. Like they sucked in their bellies. And that's their sleep. Don't fall off. That is I'm going to say on that part. And these animals are able to help out the wild in another way. Since they're feeding on low-lying vegetation, they'll <clears throat> plant the seeds they're eating, also a little bit of fertilizer. And as we can tell, she doesn't have any gardening tools, so I'll let your imagination decide how she plants those. Just keep that thought in the back of your mind. If ever out in the woods and decide to pick some wild berries, they may have been planted by a tortoise. And our animals here at the park are getting a really nice life as well. They get a lovely diet of spring mix, kale, spinach, and some of their favorite fruits are strawberries, grapes, and watermelon. Doesn't sound that bad, right? Mm -hmm. Once a week, us rangers go to public saying buy them fresh salads. I'm not sure who's better trained. Assert them. But we letting this little one head on back to me, moving back into the scrub. And I saw another critter hanging around out here today. But how does everyone feel about snakes? They don't let me throw them out as prizes anymore, so everyone should be safe. And we have a pretty unique species out here today with us. This snake's behavior is pretty similar to our tortoise. She spent the majority of her life buried underground. Here we have our Florida pine snake. The pine snake is a growing species, so she has a few adaptations that help out their life beneath the soil. And when we look at this individual, we see that she has these small black pupils, elargated nasal pits, and that shovel-like head. She'll be utilizing all those things to hunt down her favorite meal, the pocket gopher. The pocket gopher is this little rodent that likes to grow out people's yards. And this snake has adapted to head out there and eat them. Even if a bro is not available, they dig their own. They utilize that shovel-like head to move the sand and debris out of their way, then the modified scales on their backs, known as keeled scales, to etch the top of that burrow to prevent it from collapsing. Pretty smart, right? Then if we head into the more northern parts of our state, they can look a little bit different. They can have distinct diamond back-like checkering moving down their bodies. They're trying to look like someone else out here our eastern diamondback rattlesnake. Simply because if you want to be left alone, you look like someone that's dangerous. So you mimic one of the few venomous species we have out here. Since in Florida we see things of the eastern diamondback, pygmy rattlesnake, the cane break rattlesnake, the cottonmouth copperhead and coral snake. Sounds like a lot of things to worry about. But in reality, we have 44 non venomous species found out the entire state. So odds are only one of the venomous ones is still pretty low. And once you know what we're looking for, it's fairly easy to identify the differences. We take a look at the snake's head, and we notice it's very rounded in shape. Venomous snakes have a more pointed snout, a lot like an arrowhead. And with any look at the head with the back jaw area this time, one nose is still fairly rounded and smooth. Venomous snakes are cottonmouth, copperhead, and rattlesnakes have very fat, distinct cheeks and most part like shaped head. One of the final ways to tell, you have to get a little bit closer. We'll look at the snake's eyes. And one nose with this one here, it has rounded pupils. With a venomous snake, it tends to have a split pupil, a lot like a cat's. As I said, you have to get pretty close to see that part. So I like to follow an even easier rule. Leave it alone. <laughs> By leaving the wildlife alone, we all benefit. But these animals are way more afraid of us than we are of them. If we walk up to a wild snake in our yard, our shadow goes over the top of them. They see that as a predator. They think you're out to eat them. Hope that's not your goal, but the snake's mind, that's what you're going to 
you. So it flare up and hiss at us. That's a snake's way of saying back off. But at that point, we're scared. He's scared. Nobody's having a fun time at all. And they're pretty beneficial animals to have around. Snakes are amazing on scam where our neighbors, mother-in-law, children, small frogs, <laughs> scissors, snakes, and rodents. Most of them probably being the snakes and rodents part, of course. Since those rats can spread a lot of nasty diseases to us without being in direct contact. Unlike our snakes. And I don't know about all of you, but much of a couple of these guys hanging around my house. They tend to keep their hands themselves. You know, they have any hands? <laughs> don't worry, I don't have any jokes like that. <laughs> and being that this ain't non-venomous species, she still needs a way to fend herself. And when she is agitated, she's gonna pick this tail and shake that any threat. As we can tell, there are no rattles on this tail. But any snake shaking his tail at me is enough a threat to make me back away. But if that's not enough for you, our pine snakes have another secret. Near the base of their mouth, they have this enlarged flap that will allow this snake to hiss louder than a house cat. It's very intimidating when let that off. This snake wants to tell any predator around it, no, leave me alone. That defense only works but leave the snake's bluff. So that being said, I wouldn't go near yard trying to catch any random snake you see. This one's been doing programs thus for nearly 10 years. That's why she's so docile. If we're to try this little wild snake, it wouldn't go so well. They have a natural fear of us, and the snake's first instinct is to escape. If escape isn't an option, that's when they hiss. And that's really not a fun situation for anyone at all. But I do have an important question for all of you. Why do we measure our snakes in inches? Well, it makes a lot of sense if we break it down a little bit. <laughs> It's simply because the snakes don't have any feet. <laughs> <laughs> that is my last joke, don't worry. <laughs> we'll be moving down to one of my favorite environments now, our spring. The spring is a beautiful place here at Wiki Wachi. And since I have a first magnitude, we'll see a lot of different bits of life. We can see different species of birds, fish, turtles, things like our manatees, and of course our mermaids all call it home. While you're visiting our park today, keep your eyes out for a few different things. We can see fish species like our largemouth bass, our black and white striped sheep's head, and my personal favorite is our mullet. The mullet is a silver colored fish they see leaking up out of the water. It's pretty cool to watch. But the most important part of our spring isn't something we think about. It's the grass we see. The grass that grows along the river's bottom is eel grass. It is a nursery for small fish and turtles, auctions to fly the river, and one of the favorite foods of our manatee. And now that we're moving into the more winter months of Florida, we tend to see mantis inside of our springs. They want to escape the cold of the Gulf of Mexico, because when it gets down into the low 60s, it can become fatal to them. So they move into our spring, where it stays 72 to 74 degrees year-round, nice and warm. And while they're here, they need plenty of food. But the eelgrass is important as more than just a food source. It's just structure of our river bottom. It's what maintains the depth and the beauty of our spring. That's why we're so protective of our waterway. Our park might have been put on the map about 75 years ago, but it's been a resource for the animals for centuries before that. And if you look around us here in Spring Hill, it's all roads, homes, and businesses. That's no place for wildlife. That's why parks like us are so important. We allow the animals to have a home as we keep expanding. But it's also an important resource for us people. It's hard to understand what we're protecting if you don't get to see natural Florida. We're a beautiful park. And every time you visit us, you'll probably see something a little bit different. A different species of bird, turtle, wildflowers. You can always see something new at our park you know what you're looking for. But I do have another animal for you guys today. And one of my final animals are one of the more iconic ones found here in the southeast. Thing we found in nearly every body of fresh water, every county, and throughout the entire state of Florida. And here, 
I have my little friend Lucy. Lucy here is an American alligator, and she's about two years old. The really cool part about our alligators is the fact that they have maternal pair, meaning that the mother alligator hang around the first three to six months of life. Even at the two years, to make sure that this little one gets off to a good start. So say we see that baby alligator swimming around, and decide, hey, it looks pretty cute. I want to pick it up. Not really a great idea. The mom's about 10 feet behind them. And when we get too close, the baby's going off a high-pitched chirp. Then the mom's going to come running. Hope you have a plan ready. His adult alligator can run 5 to 10 miles an hour, swim 10 to 15 miles an hour, has been seen climbing small chain link fences and trees, and would potentially jump up to 6 feet high. If you were to ask the magic 8 ball on that one, it would tell you outlook not so good. <laughs> Who here's heard the zigzag method? They run in the serpentine to escape the alligators. Raise your hands. Well, we have. I would forget about that. Okay. Because it is a myth. If we notice where the alligator's eyes are, it's on the sides of its head. It's like running in a zigzag. You're just putting yourself in a better field of view. Oh, no. And she has one big muscle. She can turn whichever way she wants very quickly. Don't worry, though. There's a very easy way to escape an alligator. You just have to do one simple thing. Bring a friend that is slower than you. <laughs> it has worked out every time for me so far. It is why I'm doing the show alone today. Because you don't always have to be the fastest one. Just be fast in that person you tricked. Luckily enough, alligators are incredibly lazy. They're an ambush predator. They rather like mushes in the water or near the water's edge and wait that meal to approach them. Then at the absolute last second, the last shot and grab it. Alligators have even studied using tools and lures. They'll stack sticks and logs on our nose and submerge themselves beneath the surface. Then they wait. They wait. And they keep on waiting. And eventually a bird will come along, see that branch as a nice resting point, and that branch becomes its permanent resting point. <laughs> Not really a half bad life, you think about it from the alligator's point of view. You lay in the sunlight all day long, food lands on your face. Sounds like a nice life to me. Then once you reach this size, you only threads a bigger alligator or a person. And here in Florida, they tend to reach 12 to 14 feet long. Sounds impressive, right? Well, Louisiana has us beat. Their record is 19.9. I'm sorry to say that it's a dinosaur, <laughs> but unfortunately, we are nearing the end of my part of the program. But since I cover the land and spring aspect of the park, we have a wonderful bond here that we cover in the air side. Make sure you give her a nice welcome. There is a barred owl, B A R R E D, and they're very easy to identify because they got stripes all over them. They're barred. And they also have a very distinct hoot. Some people think it sounds like who cooks for you. It's multi-tonal. <laughs> now, Clicker here came from Georgia. So I have had some people say she says who cooks for you all. But I haven't heard that yet, so I don't know. Anyway, you know, it's really, really easy to tell the difference between a prey animal and a predator. All you have to do is look at their eyes. So if you guys look at me and you close one eye, you see me. Well, when you switch eyes, you still see me. I just shift over a little bit. That's because we're predators, and predators have single vision. A prey animal has eyes on the side of its face. If it closes one eye, it's one whole picture here. If it closes the other eye, it's one whole picture over here. And it can't put those two pictures together. A prey animal has to say, what's out there? How far away is it? Is it going to get me? Is it going to eat me? How soon will it get here? And it has to process individual images. It doesn't have one picture. <clears throat> but think about how a bird of prey hunts. It sits in a tree and it looks around. 
or if it's an eagle hawk or a falcon, it's flying around up there looking for something to eat. They have really good eyesight. You know what? They have better hearing because sometimes eyesight doesn't work. Look at what the forest floor looks like. It's got weeds this high, right? It's got leaf litter and vines and sticks and just all kinds of stuff down there. Bird might not necessarily see what it is it's hunting, but it'll hear it because it'll hear rustling and it'll hear some kind of noise. At that point, it starts looking for movement. When it sees that movement, it goes down to go get lunch. Now, you don't have to worry about a bird of prey's beak. They don't hunt with their beaks. You've all seen those eagles go into the water, right, like this, looking for that fish. This is what you have to worry about. They're not called claws, they're called talons. Very, very strong, very, very sharp. And they have to be. Because when that bird swoops down, you grab that snake or lizard or whatever it is it's hunting, well, first of all, aim has to be dead on. Second of all, it has to grab it. And third of all, it has to hold on. Because if it misses, that thing squiggles away, nothing's going to hang around and say, come on back, try me again, right? The bird's <laughs> going to be hungry. But if that bird is sitting on the ground and it's holding on with its talons and it starts eating with its beak, well, it doesn't have any defenses. Nothing wants to be on the ground defenseless. All birds of prey can take something that weighs a little bit more than they do. They can pull it up into a tree. And that's where they eat safely. A clicker looks pretty solid, doesn't she? How much do you think she can pull up the tree? Five pounds is the most common guess, I guess. 30 pounds. Yeah, we're getting closer. Anybody here ever find a bird feather? <coughs> ever find a bird feather? Mm -hmm. Right, they're hollow. They're hollow on the inside. And except for the skull and the breastbone, which on a bird is called the keel bone, all bird bones are hollow. Mm -hmm. Birds fly, and you have to be light to fly. Their whole body is designed for that. And you know, birds can do something that some people are like, whoa, yeah, that's pretty cool. You know, birds can eliminate their excess body weight about every 45 minutes to an hour. That sounds like something we want to sign up for, huh? Yeah. yeah, you know how they do it? They fly around pooping all day long. So it might not be the line you want to get it at the end of, right? Yeah. It weighs about two pounds, probably a little less than two pounds could probably pull about two pounds up into a tree. But why would she? Okay, they don't eat that much. In captivity, we only feed her about 75 to 80 grams a day. They get about 10% of their body weight. So the only time they're really going to attack a larger animal or person or something is when they're defending their nest. And this time of year, you might find that because this is breeding season. So you'll be hearing an awful lot of them. They're very common all over the eastern United States. And once breeding season starts, boy, there's a lot of noise out there. And sometimes you'll be sitting there lying in bed or listening and say, where did all those monkeys come from? Because when they get a whole lot of them together, they sound like a troop of monkeys. They <laughs> really do. Get that right. All right. How many people are here from out of state? <laughs> okay, good. Especially if you have kids, because locals do not know the answer to this. Right? You try. There's only one place in the whole world where owls can turn their heads all the way around. Any thoughts? Universal Studios at the Harry Potter exhibit. <laughs> owls, we have seven vertebrae in our neck. Okay, these guys have 14 vertebrae in their neck. Makes them pretty flexible. They can go 270 degrees in either direction. And think about it. There's muscles going up there. There's blood vessels, there's nerves. They could turn their heads all the way around and be a real mess in there, wouldn't it? <laughs> yeah, 270 degrees mm -hmm. in either direction. And they have to do that because they don't have any eye muscles. Okay, that head is pretty full of brain and there's not a whole lot of room for eye muscles. <laughs> now think about it. When you have a bird of prey, they're gonna listen. Okay, they have really good hearing. But when we hear a noise, we have to like, take a look, where did that noise come from? You know, look around, our ears are parallel. Most animals, their ears are parallel, not owls. Owls have one ear higher than the other. After the program, I'll be up for a little bit. Take a look around Clicker's beak. It looks like somebody took a toothbrush, cut it up, and glued those bristles all around the beak. Those bristles grab sound. 
transfer sound to all these really soft feathers around the face, which transfer sound to that ring. All owls have that ring because the ring transfers sound from one ear to the other. Now, owls also have something that's really unique in the bird world. They have a flap over their ears. Now they can tell if the sound's coming from the front or the back. They have directional hearing. So they have really, really good hearing. Ah, yes, they do. Yeah, isn't she cool? <laughs> you know, I'm going to give you an owl. Well, first of all, let me ask you. You think I woke her up? Everybody knows owls are nocturnal, right? You think I woke her up? You think so? Anybody here have a dog? Have a dog. Okay, what's your dog doing right now? Sleeping. Yeah. Better question is, does anybody here have a dog that's not home sleeping? <laughs> mm -hmm. Your dog going to be sleeping and hunting all night long? Ah, your dog's going to say, especially tonight because it's cooler. Like, thanks for warming that spot up for me, right? Shove over. <laughs> it's mine. No, nothing hunts all day and sleeps all night. Nothing sleeps all night and hunts all day. Think about it. When you're sleeping, you're vulnerable. There's only two times in the day, the two worst times in the day to be vulnerable. You know when that is? Day and night. Think about it. During the day, all the stuff is out. Everything's out hunting, right? At night, all the wicked stuff comes out hunting and you can't even see it. Now, we just happened to have Thanksgiving. It was a great dinner, right? Everybody had a good dinner and you've got Christmas coming up. You have another good dinner. How many people are going to the gym after you finish eating Thanksgiving or Christmas dinner? Nope, don't do it. So an owl is going to hunt and it's going to catch dinner, but it's not going to fly around all night long. It's going to hang out then and probably take a nap. You know, you can tell when an owl hunts. Not all owls are nocturnal. You can tell when an owl hunts by the color of its eyes. Okay? An owl is nocturnal, which means it's primarily active at night. Hang on one second, okay? Primarily active at night. Its eyes are black or brown. Now, up north, there's this place where it's really, really snowy. And the sun doesn't set for like six months at a time. And there's an owl that lives up there called the great snowy owl. And there is no night to hunt sometimes. You know what? Their eyes are yellow. And our great horned owl's eyes are yellow because they primarily hunt during the day. There's this tiny little owl that's really, really cute. It's called the burrowing owl. And it hunts at dawn and dusk. And their eyes are red. But all you got to do is look at an owl's eyes, and you can tell when it hunts. Pretty neat, huh? Yeah. Do you have a question? What's your question? Well, they, they, they wake up at night, and they take some naps. But during the day, they take naps. I don't know if anybody saw Opa out there. The owl that was out in front, and mm -hmm. she wasn't sleeping, you know, and she could do whatever she wants out there. So they take naps during the day and they take naps at night. Sometimes they're awake and sometimes they're not. <laughs> That's flying around my head. Yeah. So you all drove here, huh? Yeah, we appreciate that. Some of you came a good distance, I bet. And especially if you have kids, you throw some snacks in the car, huh? Because you're not going to stop at every 7-Eleven because somebody says, I'm hungry or thirsty. But if you try to be healthy, after you finish that banana or that apple or half a peanut butter and jelly sandwich, what are you going to do with the rest of it? We're in Florida. If you put it in a bag, odds are somebody's going to kick it under the seat. You're not going to know it's there. And it's going to get full of bugs. It's going to start to smell, whatever. Doing it. So you take a look at it and you say, hey, wait a minute. That apple core is biodegradable. That banana peel, too. I throw it out the window, something will eat it. And you know what? You are absolutely right. When you throw that stuff out the window, something's going to eat it. But you know what you're doing? You're on small animals to the side of the road. How many people drove here and did not see roadkill? Right? There's roadkill all over the place. Mm -hmm. And probably you saw some owls, um, some crows going out and picking at it. Now, Vultures generally are in this area, a lot of times they migrate. So you're not going to see too many vultures this time of year. But the vultures are after it too. Do you know the number one reason the birds of prey go into rehabilitation is because they get hit by cars? Number one reason. These guys are covered by the federal government. All wild animals, all native wildlife is covered by the federal government. They're very, very strict on birds of prey. Do you know if a bird 
is injured and loses its sight, or if its wing is removed from the elbow, or I'm sorry, from the shoulder down, or if it only has one leg, federal law is that bird has to be euthanized. And it sounds harsh, but think about it. A blind bird can't find food, even in a clo enclosed area, okay? A bird with one wing or one leg, it just can't balance. So it's a matter of quality of life. But if a bird is lucky like Clicker, because Clicker did get hit by a car, if a bird's lucky like Clicker and that stuff doesn't apply, you can just see how her wing was healed, but it's not well enough that she can fly, that's a rehabilitation facility, and they have 180 days to find a home for that bird once it's been rehabilitated. We're full. Homo Sassa, if you haven't been up to Homo Sassa, that's a really nice other park to visit. Homo Sassa's full. Bollywood is having a hard time finding room for eagles, okay? That rehabilitation facility has 180 days to find a home for that eagle. And if it doesn't, the law is it has to be euthanized. Now, I will tell you, the federal government is really leaning on that 102nd, 180 day thing. But the point is, let's not throw our stuff out the window, huh? Let's not throw them to the side of the road. Let's keep them all safe. Because, and I always tell kids, because you guys, you're going to turn around twice and the world's going to be yours. And you deserve a good one with a lot of nice animals and stuff. And it's our job to make sure it happens. So we're all going to save birds, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah I think so too. Okay, I am off my soapbox. Thank you so much. Does anybody have any questions? Whoa. She's full grown. She'll pop she'll be about three. She'll be three in February. Yeah, we got her I got her she happens to be a personal bird. I got her in February. And um she's, she's gonna be three. So she's still young, but she's full grown. So, Carrington's out here with Lucy. Carrington has his rules with his animal. I got mine with mine. You can come up and you can take a look and ask questions and take pictures. But if you touch her, I will bite you. So come up and you want a picture? Enjoy the rest of the day. Thank you so much. If you enjoyed this vlog, please give us a big thumbs up. Comment down below which one of those animals was your favorite. <laughs> Make sure you hit that subscribe button and the notification bell so you get notified every time we upload a video. And as always, thanks for watching and we'll see you soon. Bye, guys.